everybody else that's in here with me. Open up your Bibles. I'm going to talk to y'all. I want to hit on this again. Last week, I talked to y'all about the authority that we have in Christ. Amen. And what I, what I think is going on uh, in the body of Christ is I don't think many people that are born again and saved recognize, and this may sound crazy to you, but you're just not the same old person. The Bible says if you're born again, if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. So if you are in Christ and if you are a new creation, that means something that never existed before. All right? So I tell people, start acting like it. Start acting like it. You're a different person. Don't be afraid to learn who that new person is through Christ. Don't be afraid to learn the power and the authority that you carry. Because most people, when they get born again and saved, they walk around with the same humdrum mindset that they had before they was ever saved. Amen. You can be born again and saved, but still think like you used to think. You can be born again and saved and still think just miserably and go to heaven, but be miserable on this earth. And, you know, this, this God has given you and I authority. We have got authority. It's all through the scripture. And we're going to talk about it. But what you got to learn to do is we got to learn how we exercise that authority. The way that I like to do, uh, uh, tie it in is that when somebody becomes a police officer, they have got delegated authority. Delegated authority means when somebody becomes a cop that the state, when that person puts that badge on, that that badge is proof of the delegated authority that they carry. That badge, that badge is proof that they have the ability to enforce the laws of that state. To carry those out. Even though the judge may not be right there with them. But they've got the ability to enforce those laws. That the state has put in place. And when you and I get born again and saved. Our delegated authority. The Bible tells us very very clearly. We've been sealed by what? Sealed by the Holy Spirit. That you and I. We've got the name that is above every name. And the Bible says that at that name every knee shall bow. And every tongue. What? Every tongue. What? Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Where? In heaven, on the earth, and in the earth. Amen. You and I have been given the name that is above absolutely every name out there. The Bible says that at the mention of his name, even demons tremble. At the mention of his name. So what I'm asking you is if at the mention of his name, demon trembles, why are we not yet wielding that name more than what we are today? That is why when you walk into a store, understand something. This is why everybody in here, everybody can say, God bless you. You can walk into a store and you can say, God bless you and the atmosphere not change. A heathen will walk up to you and say, God bless you. But you walk into a store and you say, Jesus bless you. You can feel the atmosphere in that room change. You feel like you're being looked at. You feel like you're being stared at. Why? Because every demon just went on alert right then at that moment. Every demon's ears just popped up and said, this joker ain't joking, is he? They know that they're on. That's the reason the whole atmosphere. You don't believe me? Try it. Walk into a store. You don't believe me? Walk into a store and tell the clerk, God bless you. Everybody can do that. Because if you say, God bless you, you may be talking about Allah. You may be talking about some cow in India. You may be talking about some, some uh, God that people have made up. But when you walk into a room and you mention the name Jesus, the name Jesus, all of a sudden there's a pressure that is on you that you can't even see where it's coming from. But you can feel a pressure upon you that's telling you you're a weirdo. Why, and you look around and there ain't nobody there, is there? Why do you think that is? Because it is the name of Jesus. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 that Jesus defeated the enemy. And it says that he made a public spectacle out of him. In other words, he did not only beat him. And y'all heard me say this before when, the, when Jesus defeated the enemy. But what would happen in biblical days when there was wars and stuff going on. When a king defeated another king, many times they would cut off the right thumb. Why would they cut off the right thumb? So that that king could not hold the sword anymore and fight. Okay? They would cut off the right toe sometimes. Why? So he couldn't run. All right? And then what they would do is they would parade them through town showing their victory over that king. They would parade them through town and everybody would be clapping and everybody would be yelling for the victorious king. And then the king behind them, they'd tie them to a rope and they'd parade them through town so everybody knew that that king was defeated. And this is exactly what happened when Jesus defeated the enemy at the cross of Calvary. And when he said that he made a public spectacle out of him. When he rose on the third day, conquering death, conquering the grave. This is exactly what happened. Because when Jesus popped up out of that grave, it was proof that, that, that sin was the penalty of sin, death. That was proof that death had no power over the righteous. And, it made, and, and Jesus made a public spectacle out of Satan parading through in front of all of his demons, in front of all of his lynchmen, in front of absolutely everybody. It was known 
at that moment that the power of death had no power over the spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. Anybody from every devil in hell knows that. Every angel in heaven knows that. It's just on earth we struggle with that. Every demon in hell knows the power of God. Every angel in heaven knows the power of God. But it's only on earth that we question the power of God. Every demon in hell knows the authority of Jesus. Every angel in heaven knows the authority of Jesus. But it's on earth that we question it. How do I know that every demon in hell knows the authority of Jesus? Because when Jesus showed up to the demoniac that had been tied to the tombs and he is cutting himself with rocks, the demons could not not bow down and worship the king of kings. They came and they worshiped him first. And then they said, have you come to do away with us already? They had to bow to the name of Jesus. They had to bow to the authority of Jesus. And we've got it backwards. We've got ourselves bow, bowing to the lies of the enemy, to the deceit of the enemy, to worry, to fear, to depression. The only reason that you'll bow your knee to that garbage is because you don't know the authority that you carry in the name of Jesus. You don't know the power and the authority that you carry. And if you could recognize that the power and authority that Christ has given us to be set free from that stuff is greater than the power and authority that's trying to get you to bow your knee to it, your whole life would change. Your whole life would change. The things that have been holding you down, that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to hold you back. See, the enemy, the enemy, what he wants to do is people that are born again and saved, what he wants to do is shut those people down. He wants to cripple the church. That's what he wants to do. He wants to make the church look like it's powerless and significant in this world. And he wants Christians to walk around beat up, sick, broke, busted, disgusted, whooped, depressed, beat down. And when you're standing in a lineup between world heathens and Christians, he don't want anybody to be able to tell the difference. Not by looking at you physically, but by the words that come out of your mouth and by the lifestyle that you live. Come on. He wants you to fit in with absolutely everybody else. You know, I was at a deal in Tennessee uh, this past couple of days. And uh, I went up there, there's a small group. We had a, a business meeting up there, there's about 12 people. And, uh, you know, and, and these people, I met with them on Zoom and done all these things. And, and they know my stance. They, they know where I stand. I, I have no problem uh, uh, with that. But as we was there, you know, God was giving me opportunities and opportunities to share more and share more and share more. So uh, Friday night, we went out to a dinner, man, and, and these group of guys, absolutely awesome guys. Uh, and I was just thinking, I was just saying, Lord, you know, just give me an opportunity, give me an opportunity, create this opportunity. We're sitting at dinner, you know, and all of these things going on. And he's got this, uh, the guy that we're with, he's got this big room rented, you know, in this nice restaurant. We're sitting back here in the back and everybody's drinking and getting these fancy bourbons and getting this and getting that. And, uh, you know, not one time did anybody ask me if I wanted a drink. Not once. Amen. Amen. That tells me something right there. Number one, they didn't ask me that because they, my, my stance was already there. They seen no waiver in that, so they seen no need. Number one, I respect them for not trying to get me to do it. Okay. So big pat on the back to them. I, I, I respected that greatly, but they didn't even ask. I respected that even more. And I give, I give credit to them, really great group, group of guys, but I also know that that meant something in my walk and the way that I carried myself. Something was seen. Yeah. Something was seen. You know what I'm saying? Something there was seen. So as the night went on, we're sitting there talking, and, and, I, and I mean, it was really neat. I wasn't the outcast sitting over by myself, you know. I wasn't, the, I wasn't the one over here that everybody was trying to avoid. I wasn't. I mean, I was a part of the conversation. But as it went on, the conversation started going toward the Lord. So the more they drank, the more it started going to the Lord. I'm like, all right, Lord, what's going on here? I said, they get me in the spirit, now we think they get in the spirit. Amen. <laughs> And so the more it went on, but I had an opportunity to share the gospel with these guys, share my testimony. And one of the guys come up to me, he said, Kevin, he said, so how did you, what happened? And I shared my testimony. And as I'm sitting there looking at this guy, man, tears are building up in his eyes. And then everybody stops as the food's coming out. And they said, Kevin, would you do something? I said, yeah. They said, would you, would you say grace over the food? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So it just created an opportunity. I got to sit there and minister the gospel to those guys for about 20 or 30 minutes Amen. in that atmosphere. That because, and, and I just thank God for those opportunities. So, and, and one of the guys come up to me afterwards and he said, he said, Kevin, he said, you know, he said, I've talked to you on Zoom. I've done all that stuff. And he goes, but I was kind of scared of meeting you. <laughs> I said, yeah, I understand that. I said, some people are. I get a bad rap a lot of times, you know, because some things that I stand for and all that stuff. And he goes, no, but he goes, you was completely different than what I thought in my mind. And he said, man, he said, I know the stance that you take. I respect that greatly. And he said, but it's, cl it's clear. It's evident. It's in your life. We can see it and we know it. 
But yet you made me want to learn about him instead of walk away from him. Amen. Come on, brother. I said, praise God. Yeah. I said, Am I? And that's the seed that is planted right there. Right. Now it's up to God to take it from there. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So praise God. I was like, well, that don't happen too often, actually. <laughs> Amen. Let's go to the word. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about the authority we carry in Christ. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we bless you. We give you praise and we give you glory for who you are. Father God, as I minister your word today, Lord, and this is going to be the same message that I ministered a week ago, uh, but I know you're going to do something different, Father, because I've just been chewing on this and meditating on this and thinking on this, Father. And uh, Lord, I believe that you're going to do something. I believe you got something different to say to your body than what you said last week. And I pray, Father God, that you give me the ability that I be in tune with your spirit, Father God, that I would speak what it is that you would have me to speak, Lord, and only that which you would have me to speak, Lord. Any of my own thoughts, any of my own opinions, Lord, that they be nailed to the cross, Father God, because it don't matter what I think. What matters is what Jesus Christ thinks. And Father God, I pray that not only that power be upon me to minister and speak it, but that same power will be upon the people that are under the sound of my voice and those watching by way of internet, Lord, that that same power will be upon them to receive it. Now, Father, I want to pray also that your word says that that. that Satan comes immediately to steal the word that has been sown. Immediately. And I pray, Father God, that this word would be very deep into our hearts, Father God. Deep into the soil of our heart, Father. And that it would bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold return, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. The first thing that we got to understand is that Satan does have authority. However, God has given the believer more authority. Right? Satan's got some authority in this world. All right? Satan's got the ability to keep people blinded from the gospel of Jesus Christ. But now here's what you got to grab a hold of. The Bible says that Satan has blinded them from the truth. But there's only one thing that's stronger than that which blinds somebody, and that's something that can give somebody their sight. All right? So you got to understand it this way. The Bible says that you and I are more than conquerors. Right? It says we are more than conquerors. So in order for me to be more than a conqueror, then there's got to be something coming against me that's trying to conquer me. See, we get this Christian walk messed up. We think that because we're born again and saved that we're, we're not supposed to go through trials, we're not supposed to go through tribulations, we're not supposed to have battles, we're not supposed to have wars, we're not supposed to have, and we get these people that are out there saying these goofy things like, well, that can't happen to you, you're a believer, that can't happen, but, but if things didn't come against me, why does God tell me to put on the full armor? Come on, man. If things didn't come, see, in order to be more than a conqueror, there's got to be something that's trying to conquer me. Right. Amen? In order for me to be victorious, there's got to be something that's trying to defeat me. All right? Does that make sense? See, let me put it to you this way. In order for you, if you forgot everything that happened to you, if you could just forget everything that ever happened to you, if you forgot everything that somebody done to you in your past, there'd be no need for forgiveness. But because you don't forget, that makes forgiveness that much more powerful. You see what I'm saying? Because there's somebody that's coming against you that's trying to conquer you, then when you overcome that, that makes you more than a conqueror. That makes it that much more powerful. Amen. See, when you're walking in victory, see, the only way that you're going to be victorious, right? There, see, the only way that you can truly walk in victory, the only way if you're playing a football game, the only way you're playing a basketball game, the only way that you can truly walk in victory is you've got to defeat the team that's against you. Come on. If the team don't show up, you don't get the victory. I mean, you get by default. But so in this life, we look at it completely the wrong way. The reason that I have the ability to walk in victory is because God, through his word, has identified my enemy that's trying to overtake me. Amen. And once we can identify the enemy, instead of asking God, why is this happening? He's just doing his job. That's what he does. He lies, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. Is that right? He's the father of lies. That's what he does. That's what he does. But God has given us weapons of warfare to stand against the enemy. He has not left us out here with, with no battle ray in order to war against this enemy. Amen. Most people, though, you want most people want to think their thoughts away. And what we do is we sit there and listen to these lying thoughts. We sit here and listen to this lying stuff instead of putting on the armor of God, instead of getting into the word of God and shutting these thoughts down, shutting them down. And how do you shut thoughts down? You can't fight thoughts with thought. I mean, I tell people, you know, I know this may sound weird. It may sound crazy, but I tell the guys in the men's home, I say, listen, if you're in Walmart one day, if a guy's battling with lustful thoughts, I said, if you're in Walmart one day and you're standing behind a woman in the checkout line, and her top's too short, and her shorts are too short, and you find your mind roaming, going somewhere, back out of that line and go find the dude who weighs 400 pounds in a pair of overalls. Get in line behind him. And then if your mind starts wandering, we'll see you at the altar on Sunday. Get ready. We'll find out that many, many times that we'll remove ourselves from the situations that we're in, that we'll remove ourselves from the battle that we're having to face while we're in the midst of it. That's why the book of Corinthians tells us that he's made a way out. 
So, so many times we allow ourselves, you know, so many times we're having negative thoughts, we're having all this weird stuff going on in our life, but we're not assessing the things that are going on around us. We're not looking at what we're watching. We're not looking at what we're listening to. We're not listening to what we're hanging out with. So I want to continue feeding myself with all this garbage, but I want the thoughts just to leave. I want the thoughts just to leave. Well, why is this happening? You got to fight. You got your part to do. When you sign up for the military, you got to learn to fight. And God has not called Christians. We are God has called us. He is the Lord of war. And when he told uh, uh, Moses, when the, when the children of Israel or the children of Israel were escaping from Pharaoh and they couldn't go to the left, they couldn't go to the right, they couldn't go backwards because Pharaoh was closing in and the children of Israel were crying and crying and Moses went to God and what did God say? He said, why do you stand here crying unto me? Go forward. And if Moses wouldn't have went forward, the Red Sea would have never split. The other side. And there's some things in your life that you just going to have to go through. Amen. You know what's amazing about that? Y'all heard me say it many times. Isn't it amazing how one path that leads to freedom, that same path leads to death for others? So whenever the children of Israel walked through that Red Sea, that led them to freedom. Right? But when Pharaoh walked in, that led them to death. See, that's how people see the cross. To those of us that are born again, it's a path to victory and freedom. But to those that are blind to the gospel, it's death. It's death. All right, let's get into the word. All right. Let's open up Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples. Now, this is Jesus. I'm talking to you about authority today, okay? The authority that you carry in the name of Jesus. Now, this authority doesn't come to people that are not born again and saved. Right? So if you just got an idea of who Christ is, okay, you're going to get wolfed like the seven sons of Sceva. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. They're going to they, they gonna just tear you up. And I, I think there's a lot of people out there, and I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of people, that's the reason they're so beat up by the devils, because they think they're born again, but they're not. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I think we got lying preachers that are telling people, oh yeah, you're born again, oh yeah, they're out there. And they're saying the name of Jesus, but they ain't had a heart change yet. And they are wolf. They beat up like an old dog, man. Just wolf, beat down. And but the seven sons of Sceva, what did they do? They went and they said, hey, in the name of that guy Paul preaches about. What did they say? They said, Jesus we know. Paul we know. I'm going to tear you up. Right. And what did they do? Jumped on him, stripped him down naked, and sent him running down the highway or run, running down the road there, screaming like third grade school girls because they got whooped. You know what I'm saying? Because they knew the name, they knew religion, they knew the name, they knew the power, they wanted the power, but they didn't want the, the, the commitment and the obedience to follow Christ. And I think too many times today we got churches full of people that know the name of Jesus, they know the right things to say. They know the right thing. They know, they know uh, uh, Christianese. What is Christianese? You know what I mean? They know the scriptures, they know the things to say, like those guys, the seven sons of Sceva did, but there was no authority, there was no power in it. Why? Because Christ did not live in them. And so what happened, they ended up getting beat up. And I believe that happens so many times today. And, and people, they listen to me. Until we learn to examine ourselves and get that real with ourselves, nothing's ever going to change. Everybody wants to think they're just born again. But nobody wants to examine themselves according to what the Word of God says. Examine yourselves to make sure that you're in the faith. So what ends up happening, people get beat up by negative thoughts. People get beat up by every temptation that comes along, every trial that comes along. Everything that comes along, they get beat up and they're saying, I'm trying to stand, I'm trying to stand. But well, i got to ask you this question. Are you born again? See, that's a, we'll talk about that church nowadays. We just assume everybody's in this building, everybody's born again. Sometimes I have question if I'm born again. I'll be honest with you. I know some of the thoughts that I have, they're thoughts, but they're not born again thoughts. Amen. But I do know this. I do know there's an authority and there's a power in my life. Amen. So when we look at this, let's look at the word of God. And I do know faith is the, that, that I do know that faith that we're saved by faith. And we had, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, this is Jesus. He gave them power against unclean spirits. He gave them power. What did he do when he called his 12 disciples? He gave them. And you and I have got to understand something. It is no different than you and I today. Call, that means an invitation has been sent out. He invited his disciples to follow him. And see, so you and I, when God starts tugging at my heart, when God starts, to, starts tugging at your heart, that's the invitation. When you hear the gospel, if you're in here today, maybe you've never heard the gospel before. This is the invitation. When you hear the word of God, that's the invitation. 
when, when, when the word of God is going forth and all of a sudden things start happening on the inside of you, that's the invitation. And this is what he did. He called, he invited the disciples to follow him. But here's something that Jesus knew. That we didn't have the power nor the authority to follow Jesus Christ with our own efforts. Amen. You and I don't have the ability to follow Jesus Christ on our own. And there's too many times that people are there trying to follow Jesus the way they think they can follow Jesus instead of following Jesus the way the Word of God says to follow Jesus. And it's not until the Spirit of God falls upon somebody's life that you're going to re be able to reject what you think following Jesus is for what the Bible says following Jesus is. Because let me tell you what actually happens when you get born again. This is what happens when you get born again. You have forfeited the right to make your own decisions. That's what it means. Because when my decisions rise up, what? And what I do, I compare them to the Word of God, bringing every thought captive. Then at that the moment, i got to make a decision on whom I follow. Does that make sense? And many of us, we don't want to do that today. Right? So he said he gave them. What did he do? He said, and when he had called unto him the twelve disciples, he gave them power. So Jesus knew that we was going to need a power to follow him. He knew this. He didn't just say, oh, come and follow me. The rest is up to you. No. When he called us, he equipped us. In other words, Jesus said, come on, follow me. But I'm going to give you power to do something. I'm going to give you not only power to follow me, but I'm going to give you power and I'm going to give you authority to walk this thing out. Why? Because there's an enemy out there that churches don't talk about anymore. There's an enemy out there that we try to medicate instead of cast it out. There's an enemy out there that we try to counsel instead of cast it out. There's an enemy out there that we try to use man-made psychology instead of casting it out. And when you are void of the power of God, you're always going to have to retreat to man-made decisions in order to deal with the enemy. And it does not work. It does not work. There is no man-made counseling. I don't care how many doctrine degrees you got hanging on the wall. I don't care how many psychology degrees you have hanging on the wall. There is not a man-made counseling, a man-made philosophy, or a man-made psychology that can deal with the powers of darkness. It's only dealt with at the cross of Calvary and there alone. And it's by the power and the unction and the authority of the name that is above every name. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's the only way. There is no other way. Now some of you may be staring at me like a calf at a new gate. That's all right. Go on and stay in bondage. But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. All right, let's look here. And he says, and when he called, I'm going to make you through this first verse. And when he called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. Those unclean, you look it up, against unclean thoughts, immorality. How many of us think we need some demons? How many of us think that, that, that there needs some power in this world today against unclean spirits? We got men wanting to be women. Women wanting to be men. They need some power. We got homosexuality running rampant. There needs to be some power. We got lesbianism running rampant. There needs to be power. We got boys that can't compete in boys' sports. So what do they do? They go sign up for girls' sports. How many girls do you see signing up for boys' sports? We need power. We have things that are going on in this world, things that are going on. Why? Because so there is such a lack of knowledge of God. And when there is a lack of knowledge of God in this world, there is no depth of depravity that man won't sink to. There is no depth. That's why it says in Romans chapter 1 that God turns them over. Turns them over. See, we live in a society. That's why this church will never be up 1,500 people. You look, let, let me tell you this. I'm going to say this to you. I say this every Sunday. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Listen to me. This is the biggest deception the enemy throws against people. When they're sitting listening to somebody speak. Well, he preached out of the word. Well, yeah. But here's what I tell people. But well, what did he not preach? Yeah. See, we got to listen just as much to what is not said. To what is being said. What's he avoiding? What's he, what's he vo avoid saying? And we don't do that today. So I'll say this to you. If you have a church and it's just full of people living contrary to the word of God, it's not their fault. It's because it's not being spoken of up here. Come on, Come on, man. Man. It's not being spoken of up here. And where sin is not challenged, sin finds comfort. Amen. Every time. Amen. All right, let's go on. 
And it says, and when he had called on his 12 disciples, but I'm going to show you the power. He gave them power against unclean. What is that? And thoughts and morals, life, integrity, character against unclean spirits. That's the power to overcome the enemy only comes from Christ. To cast them out and heal all manner of sickness and disease. So what did he do? He gave power to overcome. So now let's think about this. He gave power to overcome, overcome unclean spirits. What are unclean spirits? Those are, those are the thoughts. The torments, the immorality, the things that run rampant in somebody's mind and thought life before it actually becomes an action. And he says, he's given us power. He's given us power. And here's the deal. Today, we, have, we don't know that power because it is not talked about. So there's so many people out there that are bound up by all of these things that are going on in their mind. And because the power is not taught, the authority is not taught, and we downplay the power of Jesus Christ because we're afraid that if we believe God to do something and God don't do what we think he should do, that somebody's going to look at me a different way. That unclean thought needs to be cast out too. Why? Because what that's about, that's not about Jesus, that's about you. So if the Bible tells me that he's given me the power to what? Do things and lay hands on the sick. If he's given me that power, then I'm not to worry about the results. I'm just to carry out the action. Does that make sense? That's what I'm to do. And so if I'm not living it out, if I'm not laying hands on people, if I'm not believing people because I'm afraid it might not work, then really the God that I'm serving is me. I'm serving my own thoughts rather than God's thoughts. And the real problem is not that it's not working, but the real problem is I can't get me out of the way because I'm more concerned about how man sees me than how God sees me. And it greatly limits the power of God. Amen? Why does it limit the power of God? Not because it limits his power, but because we're not allowing ourselves to be used in order to be a connector to his power. Does that make sense? So let's look here. So he says, and when he had called his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean, what? Spirits? To cast them out. Church. Amen. Church, listen to me. What did he do? He said he gave them power to do what? I'll guarantee you, if you'll stick your face in this book, that'll be the greatest counselor you ever need. Amen. If you'll stick your face in this book, I guarantee you, where light dwells, darkness cannot exist. Amen. So we got so many people today that are walking around, heads just, head just fouled up, heads just goofed up, heads just tormented, depressed, beat down, just all this mess going on in their head. First thing I ask people, how much time do you spend in the Word? How much time do you spend in prayer? Well, I tried that one day. You been there 50 days yet? You been there 50 days yet? No. How long have you been going to that counselor? Seven years. They must be really bad. <laughs> why? Why? What do you mean? My, my counselor is great. Why you been going seven years? Something ain't working. <laughs> Something ain't working. Right? How long you been going? Ten years. Why? What? What? You been going ten years, right? Ten years. You been going to the same counselor, right? For ten years. You been going to this counselor. I'm not against counselors, as long as the counselors that minister the word of God. Amen. That's the difference. But if you're just going into this man-made philosophy, this man-made stuff, it's going to put you in more bondage. It's going to put you in more bondage. Okay? So let's look here. Now, there's counselor, counselor, Christian counselor saved me in my wife's marriage. Christian counselor, man, sat down and got my life out of the rut and got it on track. But they spoke the truth of the word of God. And when the truth of the word of God met the lies of the enemy, one of them had to go. Right. And guess what went? Amen. All right, let's go. So he says, I've given you power. What? I've given power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Look, let's look at this. Behold, I give unto you power. That's delegated power that I was talking about a while ago. A delegated power. <clears throat> excuse me. Is that when somebody becomes a police officer, as I said with the badge a while ago, when you and I get born again and say we're given power, we have been delegated by the judge, by God, in order to carry out the work and the preaching of the gospel on this earth. So when a police officer and enforce the laws, okay, that is delegated power. When you and I get born again, this is what Jesus is talking about. You and I have been delegated power. We've been given the power. What? Through the anointing, through the shed blood, through the spirit of God, we have been given the power to what? Preach the gospel. We've been given the power. How many of us are preaching the gospel? 
How many of us are going to church and preaching the gospel? How many of us are preaching the gospel in the face of our enemies? How many of us are preaching the gospel in the face of our employees? How many of us are preaching the gospel? How many of us are preaching the gospel in our workplaces? How, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about being bold. See, see, I'm, I'm getting right in your grill right now. Amen? How many of us are actually talking about Jesus Christ in our workplace? How many of us are willing to lay down our reputation and what somebody thinks about us in order to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many? Because if you're not, if you are worried about what somebody else is thinking about you, then you need to start seeing that tap tapping into this power. There's only one way that that happens. That comes by getting to know Jesus Christ. Amen. Because the more you get to know Jesus Christ, the more you build a relationship with him, the more you study his word, the more you understand him, the more uh, time you spend with him in prayer, the more you do these things. Amen. You're, this is this is how it happens. The more bold you become. It just happens. It, it, it's not something that you got to drum up. Why? Because Jesus said it like this. He said, rivers of living water will what? He, said, he didn't say you're going to have to draw them out of your bosom. He didn't say you're going to have to make them come out of your bosom. He said, rivers of living water, they're just going to do what a river does. It's going to flow. It's going to come out of your bosom. Whatever is in you is going to come out of you. And if there ain't nothing about God in you, then that's probably what's coming out of you. Nothing about God. Amen. We just got to we got to we got to look at it. Behold, I give you power. What to tread? Now that word tread means to advance by setting foot upon, to encounter, stand against, and overcome the greatest obstacles that Satan that Satan uses to slow the progress of preaching the gospel. So what has he done? He's given us power. What does that mean? He's given us power to tread. So isn't it amazing that when when uh, God said in the book of Genesis that He's going to bruise His heel on who? On His what? Head. Isn't it amazing that that's the same power that he's given? I mean, I want you to think about this. That word tread means to step on and push off. So when the enemy comes against you, and the very thing that he's trying to do to stop you, if you can get this picture in your mind that God's given you the power to step on his head and now use it as a thrust pad to push you forward. Wow. Amen. Put like a starting block yep. when somebody's in a race. And if you can understand that, if you can start grabbing a hold of these things, and this authority is not given to somebody. This authority comes. He has given us authority. But many, many times we gotta, we got to get into the Word of God, study what this authority is, study what this power is so that we have a knowing of what it is. Amen. So that we have a knowing. See, a lot of us don't know that we have power. A lot of us don't know that we have authority. I had a guy walk up to me at the gym the other day. I was working out with a good friend of mine. We talk about the Lord all the time. And he walked up to me at the gym the other day. And he goes, Pastor Kevin. I said, what? And he goes, man, I was at church on Sunday. And he goes, the preacher preached an awesome message. He said, you know what I learned? I said, what? He goes, demons are real. I said, what? I said, you didn't. I said, I'm going to blow your mind. You're great. I said, you know, demons are just as real as God is. And I said, you know, hell's just as real as heaven is. And he said to me, he said, yeah, but I thought demons were like in some third world country, you know. He goes, but they're, yeah. I said, I said, yeah, they're, they're in church with you. I said, they're in church with you. They're in church with you. So demons, so so many times what demons have learned to do in America is learn how to hide. That's it. Yeah. They've learned how to hide behind a whole bunch of stuff. All right? Let's go from here. And he says, behold, I give you power to tread upon what serpents. What are serpents? Ser Satan is always referred to in the Bible as a serpent. Scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Behold, I give unto you power. This is Luke 10, 19. To tread on serpents. And scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This power is over the enemy. Now, here's what you got to understand. This is where people get it wrong. They think that when you've been given power, they think people think that that means that nothing's going to come against them. Yeah. If nothing was to ever come against you, would you have any need for this power? No. Right. If nothing was to ever come against you, would you have any need for this power? Right? So when we look at that, if we look at the disciples and the way that the disciples were killed and martyred and all of these, there were definitely things that come against them. So this power, listen to me, this power doesn't mean that you're never going to face hard times, never going to face troubles. It doesn't mean that you're not going to face people wanting to kill you, wipe you out. That, that's not what it means. Matter of fact, Jesus promised us that stuff, did he not? But this power is going to give you the ability to stand in the face of adversity and not bow your knee to it. This power is going to give you the ability that in, and that in Christ, and let me just break it down to it, because many of us in here, we've never faced death. 
We've never had to face something for to give something up for the preaching of the gospel. So let me just get it right on down to, to our jobs and our homes and our houses, okay? Let me just get it right on down to Chico Mart over here, okay? That when we're just in our day-to-day, -day, and we love to sit here and think, well, you know what? I'm not giving up my life. So, you know, they come to me, they're just going to chop my head off. But yet, when we're around a bunch of our co-workers and they're telling filthy jokes and all that stuff, we ain't even got the ability nor the power to walk away. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll say we're church, we'll say we're going to church and all that, but church, because of the way that we live in front of the people, church is nothing more than just something that we do on Sunday to keep our family happy. But they see no power, and that's the problem with the church today, that people go to church, but they're not the church on the outside. Does that make sense? So what we sit here and do, so he gives us this power. What is this power that he gives us? He gives us the power over unclean, that no matter, no matter what man-made psychology, no matter what man-made philosophy, no matter what man-made religion. I mean, we look at all of these things today, humanism going on. We look at these preachers out there that got TV shows on TV that tell people that there's no hell. There's no hell. And people flock to it. Why? Because there's no punishment for you living however you want to live and completely fulfilling the lust of our flesh. And people flock to that. And the power, this is what the power of God will do. The power of God in your life will give you the ability to discern truth from error. Right. The power of God in your life, the Bible calls it a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. Right. There is a spirit of truth who is in Jesus Christ. But Paul also talks about the spirit of error. There is a spirit of error. And too many people today, they think they're being led by the spirit of truth, but they're actually being led, led by the spirit of error. And the spirit of error that they're being led by, it's kind of blinded to the truth of the gospel. And that's why it's so very, very important that you and I, whatever opportunity it is that we have, that we speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the only thing powerful enough to cast that down is the truth. That's it. That's the only thing that's powerful enough to cast it down. And there's these things that come against us, there's these wars, there's these battles, these, these, these thoughts that come against us, and it looks good, and it sounds good, and it tastes good. But the whole plan of it, just like how Satan got Eve in the garden, he said, surely God did not tell you that you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden. And that's exactly right. God told her you could eat from any tree, but not that tree. Not that one tree. But the enemy made it look like something else. And so what did she start doing? She started doubting God's word. She started doubting God's word. Error crept in. She started that. And you and I, so many times, because of something that we see, something that we want, something that we desire, something that the enemy's telling us, whatever it is, something going on, we start doubting God's word. And if we are not rooted and grounded on the things of God, if we are not rooted, if our house is not on the solid rock, the solid rock, Jesus Christ, him and him alone, then we're going to be tossed to and fro by every wind and the wave of doctrine that comes along. The Bible says, do not, in the book of James says, do not. It says, you're like a wave building up and crashing down. One day we're up here, one day down here. Have you ever been around people like that in your life? One day they're up here, next day they're down here. One day they're up here, oh, glory to God, glory to God. Next day they're down here, up here, down here, up here, down here, up here, down. Up and down, up and down, up and down. I don't know which one are you going to get when you talk to them today. That's in the Bible. Book of James. It's right there. That's not of God. God is not up. God is not down. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Lord thy God. He changed not. And I'm not saying that we don't have bad days. I'm not saying that things don't come against us. I'm not saying that attacks don't come against us. Amen. I'm not saying that. But I am not moved by the circumstances that come against me because the circumstances that come against me don't dictate my joy. Amen. 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 That don't dig because my eyes are not on circumstances, but my eyes are on Jesus Christ. Amen. And as long as my eyes are on circumstances, and when circumstances change, I'm going to change. But when my eyes are on God, amen, I can be locked up in prison like Paul was, and I can still be sitting there singing hymns, and the other prisoners here, what does God do? Come and bust the doors wide open. Because our focus has got to be on God. And here's what you and I got to do. We cannot allow the enemy to come in and get our focus on the circumstances and get them off of God. That's what he wants to do. That's the whole reason that Jesus started, I mean, uh, Peter started sinking when he was walking on the water. Jesus said, come to me. He got out. He was walking on the water. And what ended up happening? He took his eyes off of Jesus, started looking at the circumstances, started looking at the water, and he started sinking. And that's what you and I do. We look at the report of the doctor. We look at the report of the children. We look at the report of the teacher. We look at the report of my bank account. We look at the report of the news. We look at the report of the outcome of the presidency. We look at all of these reports and we allow it to dictate our walk. 
Why do we do that? Because we're looking for something in this world to fulfill us rather than Jesus Christ. And you can always tell somebody that don't, know, that, that don't have a strong relationship with Christ. Because circumstances dictate their emotions. I'm not saying, don't get me wrong on that. Y'all with me? I'm not saying we don't have good days and bad days. But my goodness. Wave. It's in the Bible. Book of James. You ever read that chapter right there? Like a wave. Builds up. Come down. What does the Bible do? It says that man is unstable. Oh, no. oh, not just about the relationships he's in, but he's unstable in his job. He's unstable in his relationships. He's un and he says he's unstable in all his ways. They don't know the power. All right, let's go on here. Ephesians tells us what? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wild. What is the wild? The deceit. The deceit. People that, let me go back to that. People that are moved by every little thing makes them mad, makes them happy. Yeah. I was in an airport yesterday and I sat there waiting there this lady sitting across from me. And uh, it's like God sometimes magnifies my hearing. My wife says I can't hear it all. Sometimes God magnifies it. <laughs> so this lady is talking to her 16 year old daughter this this is what the mom says to the daughter on the phone she goes i'll tell you what she goes i couldn't be at home and I, she said i couldn't be here in tennessee in some bar right now with my friends but i'm coming home a day early in order to celebrate your birthday with you oh my gosh. and so i'm sitting there listening to her talk and then she goes now listen to this she goes all them drunk teenagers in there at the house she goes they better be sobered up or gone by the time i get there because that's completely disrespectful being that drunk in my house and i was like I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm like, do you hear the words that are coming out of your own mouth? And this is the world. Yes. This is the world. This is normal talk. These are normal actions. All right, let me get back to this. All right, let's go. It says, so, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. What is the wiles? Deceit and cunningness of the devil. So now we got to understand that we, when, when the enemy comes against us, okay, there's three things that happen here. Number one, in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. What's number one? That you be able to stand against the lies and the attacks of the devil. It may be hard. And I keep on saying this. This is where Christians miss it. You think when you get born again and saved that that means that the enemy's not allowed to mess with you. That's where the church misses it. Because we stand up and we say things like this. Well, he can't do that. He can't do that. No, he, he, he can jack with you. He can mess with you. He can chase you down. He can. He can absolutely wear you out. But here's my question. Why are you letting him do it? There you go. Why? We think that's some kind of badge of honor. Oh, the enemy just coming. Wearing me out. Just won't leave me alone. Well, what are you doing? Always in my head today. What'd you let him move in for? Well, he's charging rent. Do something. Unless you let him live here for free. I mean, the Bible tells me that I've got the ability to bring every thought captive. Casting out every high thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So my question is, why do we walk around like we're doing some kind of honor to God, laying there on the ground, getting kicked by the enemy? The way that I look at that is that, that, that's a complete rejection of the power that's been given to you and I. So if I allow myself to walk around, man, I, I just look at this weird. Let, let, let me break it down y'all this way. I'm going to go back. When I was in the world, I used to fight. I mean, I wasn't going to allow somebody and, and to, to come up, talk, talk smack to my wife, talk smack to me. It just wasn't going to happen. I was not going to be, back then, disrespected that way. It wasn't going to happen. And so now it just makes sense to me, now that I'm born again and saved, why would I let the enemy do anything less? Why would I let him do any more? 
Why would I just lay there and be a punching bag for the enemy? Why would I just lay there and listen to his lies? Why would I just lay there and listen to his torment, telling me I'm never going to be nothing, telling me I'm going to be a failure, telling me nothing's ever going to change, telling me that I don't have the power to do it, telling me all of these things. I just sit there, and here is the deal. So many of us sit there and say, I don't do that, but I, I know I'm going to step on some ground here. But the evidence of you not taking authority is all over you. You can't see it because you got accustomed to living that way. But the evidence of lack of authority is all over you. The evidence of knowing the power of God, the evidence of knowing the authority of God, the evidence of knowing the victory of God, the evidence of knowing down here on the inside of me that he may come, he may attack, he may come with every devil from hell, but I have been given the name that is above every name. Yeah. And when you've been guessing, see, there's just something I knew. When I, was out there in the, when I was out there in the world, I could be in a bar and there could be five or six guys, but I knew I had something. And I, it's crap, but I knew I had these and I was good with them. I knew it. And you can ask my wife, whether it's three, four, five, six, seven, I knew I had something. These guys around me up are like, all right, you gonna, there might be five or six of you, but I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a couple of you. I just, I knew, it, that was a cockiness, that was a confidence, I knew I had some. I knew I was going to be able to stand. I knew I was going to be able to, to handle myself. Now, I ain't been in a fight in 20 years. But now when I look into the Word of God, this just makes sense to me. Then when He tells me, He's given me this power. He's given me this authority. And when the enemy, who to me ain't no different than a bunch of fellas in a bar that are trying to jump on me. And when all the lies of the enemy, and they sit over and say, we're going to stomp you, we're going to do that. I said, oh, you lying like a dog right now because you don't know what's about to happen to you. That's right. You ain't going to back me in that corner. Yeah, I may be a little bit nervous. I may be a little, there may be some fear, but I learned how to use fear as a great motivator. That's right. Because I'm a lot more scared if I don't fight what's going to happen to me than I am if I do fight. And when the enemy comes in and starts telling the lies, I'm more scared of where I'm going to end up instead of where I trust that God's going to take me if I stand up and face my adversary with the authority that's been given. Amen. And so many of us today, we just sit there and listen to the lies. And so many of us today, listen to this. We can't grab a hold of this because we are so beat down. It's like the people, the Jews, when they were talking to Jesus in John chapter 8. Jesus said, hey, 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 hold on. If you were of your father Abraham, you wouldn't be wanting to kill me like you want to kill me right now. Right? And what, what did the Jews say? They look at him and they come back and they say, like, what, what do you mean? We, we, we've never been in bondage to anybody. We've never been in, and I'm sitting there and I'm reading that and I'm going, what in the, what do you mean you've never been in bondage to anybody? They haven't been in bondage to the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Jebusites, the Ethiopians. They've been in bondage to everybody. And when they said that, they were in bondage to Rome. Yep. But they were so used to living in bondage that they did not even recognize they were in bondage. Amen. Too many of us today have learned how to live in bondage. We've learned how to tolerate the lies of the enemy. We've learned how to tolerate less than God's best. We've learned how to tolerate these things. And we're saying, you're going to walk out of here today and you're going to say, I ain't no bondage. Jew. <laughs> Jew are too. Jew are too. <laughs> <laughs> You are too. Quit. But they didn't recognize the bondage that they were in. There's going to be many of us who will get up out there. I'm talking about the Jewish people in Rome. That they didn't recognize. There's so many of us today, we're going to get up, we're going to walk out of here today, and we're not going to do anything about different. Yep. Because this has become normal. I'm not going to fight the thoughts. Yeah. I'm not going to fight the depression. I'm not going to stick my face in that book. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to say I got it. I'm going to say I got it. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We're going to say I'm free. We're going to say all that stuff. Like you tell your kids. Oh, it's okay. You want to find out how free your kids are? Yeah. 
Go take your cell phone away from them. You'll find out if they got bondage or not. You won't find, see, bondage don't always just show itself out there. It doesn't come across and say, this is your bondage. Yeah. But you walk in, you walk up to your kids and say, we're taking that cell phone for one week. <laughs> Take it away. I triple dog. You know why you won't? Because you're in bondage also. Right. You you're go. in bondage to the fear of what the kids going to do. You're in bondage to the fear of what's going to happen. Right. You're in bondage also. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if you go, you take your cell phone away from your kid, and that kid has a wall out fit, can't get out of bed for three days. That's not freedom. No. What does that mean? So we've got to understand. You want to make right? We think. Stop it. Quit it. Leave me alone. Stop. No, back in the biblical days when they wrestle, there was one or two things that happened. The loser got his eyeballs gouged out. And what was the purpose of gouging his eyeballs out so he couldn't see the wrestle again? Either that or what they do is they put their neck on the ground and stand on their neck until their neck broke. Why? So they couldn't fight again. So when you wrestle, when you got in there, he says, we don't wrestle. See, there's an enemy. Listen to us. Listen to me on this. There's too many people that their eyeballs have already been put out and they can't see the Word of God. They Come can't on, see the truth of the Word Come of God. On. Can't see it. There's too many of us that were blinded at the enemy of this world. Y'all remember when I was preaching here a few weeks ago and I was talking about, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the king's name, but he made the, uh, the, he made the pact with the Jewish people and he said, he said, I'm going to gouge your right eyeball out. Right. Remember that? Yeah. And the purpose for gouging the right eyeball out is because when people fought with shields back in those days, they'd hold the shield with their left hand because left-handed people, right. they did because it would throw the whole line of the army off. So you held the shield with the left hand and you thrust it with the sword in the right hand. But the reason you want to gouge the right eyeball out is because when you had the sword here, let me see your Bible back. Let me see your book here. When you had the sword here, you don't stick your whole head out here because you become, but you look around your, you look around your shield with your right eye. Nahash. Nahash. And he said, I'm going I'm to dig your right eyeball out. Why was he going to dig the right eyeball out? Because they couldn't defend themselves. They couldn't fight. They had to expose more of themselves. Right. And there's too many of us that the enemy's blinded us. There's too many of us that we can't see these truths that are in the Word of God. There's so many of us that the enemy were blinded to the truth. And it's not that we don't want the freedom. We just can't see how to get it. We can't see how to get it. And so what do we do when we can't see how to get it? We, we go and start looking for man-made ways to give me this freedom. And then I just get in bondage to the man-made ways. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yes. There's only one truth out there that sets people free. Yes, Jesus. And that's the word of God. That's right. Jesus Christ. That and that alone. Right. So the more we start going and looking for freedom away from the word of God, the more bondage that we're actually getting into through our looking for freedom. Does that make sense? Yep. And then we end up, then it rolls down here, our kids. I mean, then we got vacations. Getting them started in bondage early. Training them up in bondage. Training them up. Little kids, three years old. Put them in bondage. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle, not against flesh and blood. So my wrestling, listen to me. My wrestling's up here. Right. My wrestling, I mean, your, your wrestling's not against flesh and blood. The biggest battles you're ever going to fight is right here between your ears. Come on, man. I remember when Mark first came into our home. I told him, I said, Mark, man, I mean, he'd been drinking how much whiskey a day? Bunch. <laughs> Bunch. I know when he come in, it like this. He was sitting there like that. His hands just shaking like this. I said, ooh. I said, I remember that. I said, I remember that. And Mark, man, he didn't know nothing about God. Didn't know nothing. He didn't know nothing about God. He didn't know nothing about the Lord. He had heard about him. And I always go back to this story because I appreciate his commitment yes. on what he did. But I remember for it sat there for two weeks, and hands, and hands started going like this. And they just started going down. They just straight right on that. Was it easy? No. no. But he grabbed a hold of this word. He grabbed a hold of something, even though he didn't know nothing about it. 
But he started coloring in his Bible. And he just started reading his Bible. He just started reading his Bible. And you might sit there and say, well, Kevin, it don't work that way for everybody. Well, I'm talking about it one time. Worked that way for me. Amen. Worked that way for Mark. Amen. Worked that way for Clayton. Worked that way for Michelle. Worked that way for my wife. Come on, man. Worked that way for you, didn't it? I don't believe it. I believe you got to, And here's, I keep going back to this, but here's where we miss it. We think it's easy. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's true. We think, we think oh, the, Lord the Lord's going to deliver me. You think, oh, yeah. all right, he's going to deliver you. Yeah. He's going to deliver you, but you still might have to walk through the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I want you to grab a hold of something, church. The wilderness is not a bad place. See, it's in the wilderness that manna come down out of heaven. Come on, man. It's in the wilderness that the rock followed them through and water came out of it. Amen. It's in the wilderness that the Red Sea was split. See, it's in the wilderness that God led them by a cloud of glory and day and a flame of fire at night. It's in the wilderness that you're prepared to cross over to the promised land. And if you're not willing to walk through the wilderness experience, then you're never going to enter into the promised land. Amen. Amen. We want the promised land. Don't want the wilderness. Yeah. It's in the wilderness that all the miracles happen. You ain't got nothing else. That's it. It's in the wilderness. It's in the wilderness. Let's go down. I'm going to skip over a couple things here. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We're not using weapons made by man. Man-made psychology, man-made counsel. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Let me explain to you what these strongholds are. To destroy the man, now this is the actual meaning of these strongholds. To destroy the man-made ideas, man-made philosophies, humanism, the pushing of counterculture, boys being girls. The word in us destroys these worldly philosophies that have become strongholds and so many that has taken them to hell. These can't, now listen, these cannot become rooted in the mind of the believer. I believe that with all my heart. And you may sit there and say, well, Pastor Ken, then you're not a believer in the Word. If the Word says God made them male and female, and you're trying to justify a man becoming a woman, you're not a believer in the Word. That's why I can get rooted and grounded in you. Because you're not a believer. Right. That, that, that's it's just that simple. You're not a believer. Because if you're truly a believer, then you being a believer would uproot that idea. Amen. There you go. Amen. See, you can only become, uh, you, you can only go one of two ways. So if you think that a man can be a woman or a woman can be a man, okay? If you think that people can live in sexual immorality, and God's okay with it, then you're not a believer. Right. right. That, that's the truth of it. That's what it boils down to. You're not a believer. Well, I believe in God, well, so does the devil. Right. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that, that, that Satan believes, but he's not going to be saved. Right. Y'all remember here a while back, I did a message that says, does Satan have more faith than you? Right. Satan believes. Amen. So let's just walk around. So when we look at that, if I really, really break it down, I really, really look into the Word of God. And if I look in the Word of God, I'm saying, yeah, but. Okay? Yeah, but. And if the Bible says a male, you know, he made a male, he made him female. If the Bible tells us that, you know, drunkards, liars, you know, all of these things will have their part in the lake of fire. And if I'm going, mm, yeah, but, then the fact of the matter is you don't believe. So why is that from stuff getting rooted in your life? The fact of the matter is because you don't believe. You're not a believer. You're a compromiser, but you're not a believer. Because here's what I believe. The Bible tells me very, very, very clearly. All right? The Bible tells me very, very clearly through his word that if I'm his what? Disciple. Right? And John, he tells me then... I shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set me free. Now, does that mean that's going to set me free from every battle and every struggle that comes against me? 
No, but it is going to set me free from the lies of the world that they try to get me to adopt. Come on, man. Come on. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, I may be walking in some blindness here for a minute. Okay, the enemy may have the blinders on my mind, but when I look into that word of God or I hear it out of the word of God, <clears throat> the Bible says that the God of this world has got to blind it, lest what? Lest the glorious light of the gospel should what? Shine through. So the only thing that's got the power to remove the blinder is the preaching, not the compromising, but the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's got the power. So when we look at this, I'm talking about the authority of the believer. The authority and the way the authority, the way the believe what I'm going to finish up with today. Amen. Casting down imaginations, that's arguments. Exalt this itself against the knowledge of God. Casting down imaginations, which is arguments. That means that we demolish all theories, reasoning, man-made wisdom, religion, myth, lies, misinformation indoctrination of children, schools, all of these things that try to defy the knowledge of God. Men wanting to be women, women wanting to be men, false religions. This is why the world or Christ uh, goes through. So this is what the Word of God does, bringing every thought into captivity, every thought that is trying to get us to be disobedient to what God's Word teaches us. So when we look at this, casting down, here's what we got to have. Would I need to cast something down if it didn't come? Would I need to take something captive if it didn't come? Church, this is what I'm trying to get you to grab a hold of. Why does this keep happening? Why is this happening to me? Why do these thoughts keep coming? Why, why? So we sit there and somewhere we've got this false idea that me being saved means that these thoughts are not going to come. And when I read the Word of God, I just see it completely. Captive. Come on, man. If these imaginations didn't come, why would I not need, why would I need, why would Jesus need to tell me in His Word to cast them down? Now, here's what you got to grab a hold of. Some people think, you may be sitting here today and you may be saying, well, you know what, I don't need to do that. I don't ever have bad thoughts like that. Maybe your thoughts ain't bad. Maybe your thoughts are you don't see your need. Yeah, right. Because let me let me put it to you this way. I believe the enemy's pretty slick. Oh, yeah. See, if he's already got you where he wants you, he wants to let you have a false sense of security that there ain't nothing you need to do. Does that make sense? But to those of us that are doing the work of God, those of us that are praying, those of us that are seeking, those of us that want to serve God, He's going to try to do everything He can to stop you. But if you ain't affecting God, if you ain't growing God, God's kingdom and knocking the enemy's kingdom down, yeah, you're going to walk through this life. You're going to go, I don't know what that dude's talking about. That makes sense? Yeah. You're going to go through because you're not a threat. You're not a threat. Casting down every high thing. So when these thoughts come, and it tells me, you ever been somewhere? You see somebody over there and this thought hits you. I need to go pray for that person. Okay, now let me ask you. And then you didn't. Which thought did you just cast down? The one from God or the one from the enemy? Which thought did you? And here's the sad thing I'm going to tell you. I believe more of us cast down the thoughts of God than we do the enemy. Go over and pray for that person. No, don't do that. Go over and pray for that person. You better not. What if it don't work? What if it don't work? Yeah, Jesus, you're right. I don't want you to look like a fool. So what do I do? I don't go pray for that person. What thought did I just cast down? Share the gospel with that person. You've been working with that person how long? Have you ever invited them to church? No. You ever shared the gospel with them? No, I did tell them God bless you one day. 
<laughs> Have you ever thought about sharing the gospel with them? Yeah. Whose thoughts are you casting there? We don't think about it that way. I won't be judgmental. Don't hurt me say this. Go to a funeral, somebody's dead. Preacher stands up and says he's in heaven. You ever heard anybody stand up and say, quit being judgmental? Yeah. <laughs> but if you say he's in hell, they're going to say, quit being judgmental. But either way, it's a judgmental decision. But it's a good decision, whether it's bad. So my question to you is, what thoughts do we spend more time obeying or what thoughts do we spend more time casting down? Because they're both there. Are they not? Yeah. I need to go apologize to that person. Nah. I ain't gonna, you don't know what that did to me. I need to forgive Mark. I don't know who you talk to, but you don't know what he done to me. What thought did I just cast down? The Bible tells me that if I don't forgive others, I'd expect my Father in heaven to forgive me. This is the simplicity of the authority of the believer. Let me tell you the simplicity. See, we're trying to make it some big deal, but we're trying to pull the clouds out of the sky. We want to move the sun and move the stars and change the nation, but we can't even win the battlefield in our mind right now. I can't even go lay hands on somebody. So this is the authority of the believer. For Mark, just simple steps. Let me tell you how to just simply act this and build on it. This is the authority of the believer. That thought hits your mind, says, hey Mark, lay hands on David right there. Go pray for him. Nah, he don't need my prayer. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, that's just me. I don't want to do it for my own self-glory. So we find all these excuses not to do it. Let me tell you how to exercise the authority of the believer. Go do it. There he is. Man. That's how, that's how we exercise. And we want to make it this big, hard, mystical, super spiritual deal. Press. You're just too beat up. Authority. Get up and go. Why? Because I'm going to show that thought, that lying devil, that he don't have the power to keep me in bed. I'm going to show that thought, that lying devil, that you don't have, you don't have the power to keep me from being a blessing to somebody else. You're not holding me back. That's the authority of the believer. And when you start taking those small steps, you'll see it's going to start growing. It's going to start getting bigger and bigger. I was at a prayer meeting the other day that Connie invited me to. I'm up there, and I mean, wonderful. It was a wonderful time, but I'm sitting up there, and I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I'm like, Lord, I, I can just feel the Lord down back here downloading stuff in me, downloading stuff in me, downloading stuff in me. I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, Lord, I ain't going to say some of this stuff. I ain't going to say some of this stuff. I'm sitting back here, I ain't going to say some of this stuff. Lord, I don't get invited somewhere too often. This is why. Got my big mouth. So here we are, Lord. We get invited somewhere again. You want to screw it up again? <laughs> what you said. But that now, and see, it's those. That's how I see authority. We want to do all these big, huge things and get up and say these messages that make me beat on my chest. But I can't lay hands on a person. Walmart. I got to sit there and struggle in front of people of God with what God's downloaded in my spirit. I got to sit there and analyze and say, Lord, they don't, they don't like that. They ain't going to like that. But something, let me tell you, I know I'm carrying on here, but when you study out Moses crossing the Red Sea, many of us think that that water just split. When they sit there and watch it split, and it split, and then when they seen the clear path, then they walked. No. That's not how it happened. He stepped on the edge of that water, and it split that part. Then he stepped again. 
he didn't slip that far. And then he stepped again. And as Moses kept walking forward, the Red Sea kept opening up. See, as you're obedient to that voice, as you go lay hands, God's going to open opportunities. As you go minister the gospel, God's going to make opportunities. As you cast that, as you do it, as you do it, God's going to make ways. As we speak, God's going to move. As we pray, God's going to move. As we lay hands on the sick, God's going to heal. As we speak the authority in Jesus' name, demons are going to flee. As we do it. And we're not seeing it because we're not asking it. We're not doing it. We're setting back. As you minister the gospel, people are going to be saved. But which authority, which one has more authority in our mind? Oh, what are they going to think? Don't go over and do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. What are they going to think? What are they going to think? Which thought did I just cast out? Which thought did I just bring captive? Now, let me put it with you. So that means bring a prisoner. That means if they're a prisoner, we try to escape. They would grab that prisoner. They would grab the king, whoever he was, and bring him to the king and say, What do we do with him? What do we do with him? Execute him or lock him back up. You know what we're doing too many times? We're taking the thoughts of Christ and bringing them to the enemy and saying, What do you want to do with him?